Well, good afternoon and welcome to the new rebranded show. So I'm here at the Barn Theatre in Sarancester, behind the barn door, um, and welcome to Couch Confessions with Dr Dawn. So to start the series, who better to invite to join me than the nation's best known and favourite interior designer and my dear, dear friend, Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen. Lawrence, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Because I know uh, you're very much locked down at your house mm. outside Siren Sester with the whole family. Mm. So life's pretty busy. Yeah, no, and it's a very... Uh, I don't know, I've never really worked out before quite how boisterous, hungry and messy my family actually were. <laughs> and I was, well, no, you do, you do. Because, of course, you, you, you know, when they're young, you're anticipating all sorts of stuff everywhere and discarded toys and uh, these sort of plaintive cries of, uh, Daddy, I need wiping. Uh, but, you know, now they're in their 20s, you would have thought they'd moved on from that. <laughs> they have moved on from the wiping, to be fair. <laughs> Very um, glad to hear but, of course, they both got, well, one's got a husband, one's got a fiancé. And uh, we've got a, a, a grandson as well. So we have definitely become a... a, a, a a freak show, um, but a freak show that can't move. And you know, can't, be can't be seen by anyone we else. We can't be seen by anyone else. <laughs> it's just doing our freaky thing. You can't monetize our, it. Yet. Our freak flag is flying, but only at home. Um, but it's, you know, I mean, for goodness sake, this, it's, it's been a wonderful um, experience. I, I've always wanted to have so much more quality time with my low quality family. And so there we are. But you only just made it back because I know you've been working an awful lot in Australia, haven't you? Yeah, the, the, that, that was. Um, uh, that was, it was very complicated um, because just as lockdown was being mooted really um, and of course it's something that was happening uh, at different rates across the world Australia was actually very quick and very you know emphatic about what it wanted to do but I was just coming to the end of a very 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 lengthy series so we were on week I think it's about week 15 um, and coming up to uh, two challenges off the grand final of house rules and the issue was whether I was going to crumble and dissolve into a, 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 a puddle of celebrity tears and say, get me, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Get me out of here now. Uh, or else I'll never get home. Or whether I'd sort of stick with the Mexican standoff and hope that there would still be a flight by the time we finished filming. Um, and it was a constant thing. And the last, in the end, we pulled two of the challenges. Um, but the last two or three days, literally... I was on a flight and then off a flight, on a flight, off a flight, because they were just cancelling them, left, right and centre. Um, and um, the final indignity was that the, 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 the lovely hotel where I stay um, suddenly got converted into, um, uh, into a, a, a lazaretto, as they call it in the Renaissance, somewhere to put plague victims. Mm. Um, there was a big thing in Australia, there was a, a, a cruise ship that came back, which basically accounted for nearly all the uh, COVID uh, cases that they had. Um, and they all trooped into my hotel at about five o'clock in the morning, just as I was leaving. So you're jolly lucky to be clear. Then. Well, I mean, it was really strange. And, and so I stayed one more night and room service arrived in, um, you know, like in a lead container, sort of pushed, uh, the guy pushed it with broomstick. Um, so I was very, very pleased to find that I did actually get a flight that night and get back in time. But I mean, each each stage, I got as far as um, I got as far as Qatar. I didn't know whether I could get any further than that. Um, and then I did finally get to um, Heathrow and uh, uh, came through and realised I'd left my telephone on the plane. <laughs> So you couldn't call for a lift? <laughs> Basically, no. Uh, so I had that t took uh, a bit of irritation. But no, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that I think this, this situation has done for a lot of people, me very much, is really get you to stop and realise that we've been very cavalier, um, very um, quick to just accept our ability to go all over the world without, you know, as, as if it was a casual thing. Um, actually, there's an enormous amount that, 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 that goes into being able to get someone to Australia. And yet we become incredibly, uh, uh, we become incredibly casual about it. We become incredibly um, uh, entitled to it, I think. Because mm. you've spent a lot of time, I know, you know having spoken to Jackie mm. over the last few years, you've, been, you've spent more time in Australia than here, I think, haven't you? I, 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 I've certainly spent more time in the lounge at Dubai Airport. <laughs> than I have in my house in Cornwall. I worked that one out. Um, and uh, uh, to the extent that I often help out now, you know, if bit, there's a lot going on, I'll put, put around, you know, pass around the canapes and stuff. Uh, but yeah, now Australia, um, the House Rules series, which is in its season seven, eight, um,
because it's uh, I'm judging people's houses all over Australia. Um, you know, I can't kind of just nip in and nip out. You know, I, I'm I'm there really for the for the long haul. And so, literally, what's the, the literally what's the concept of the show then? Do, do they do their house up and then you judge it? How do, how does it work? I'd love to say it was more complicated than that, Dawn. <laughs> I'd love to say there was a lot more involved, but mm, basically that's it. Um, although, what's good about Australia? I mean, you know, a lot of the other shows, like the apartment that I do in Asia, that's a very short span. Um, it's, a, it's a bit like Changing Rooms made by MTV. Uh, it's a lot of uh, B-list celebrities in Daisy Duke shorts, really, doing a bit of painting. Um, house Rules is much more... It's, it's got that real digger spirit, you know, let's actually tear the house down and rebuild it. Um, it's much more architectural. There's a lot more going on in it, and I like that. I like the the the, the, the bluffness of the way that everything happens uh, with an Australian makeover. Um, it's less about the frilly stuff, and uh, um, they've also got the incredibly good taste to actually enjoy my opinions. Goodness and say. how did that come about? Was it a concept that you took to them, or did no, they approach you? No, they. I mean, you know, the. Never underestimate the, the, the global pull of changing rooms. I mean, that was a, uh, a changing rooms was one of the first really, really big BBC exports and was very popular in Australia, you know, 20 years ago. So actually, I've always been quite well known. And um, they were looking for a rebrand. Um, and one of the weird things these days is it seems that, you know, actually, one of the, the great British cultural um, exports uh, is um, uh, grumpy middle aged men. <laughs> you know, me, Clarkson, Ramsey, uh, Cowell, you know, we, we, all of us deserve the Queen's Award for Industry. I think export. We're being exported all over the globe to comment on how people do stuff. Interesting. So changing rooms, I guess, for you is like embarrassing bodies for me. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. It's every bit as embarrassing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but every bit as embarrassing. Just, just tell me, because I, I remember hearing somewhere, was it Jackie that was first asked to do that? And she said no. No, well, she, did, she wasn't asked to do changing rooms, but she, was, um, uh, she had a television agent because she, she'd written the uh, Debrett's Wedding Etiquette Guide, which is still pretty definitive. And because uh, she was a wedding organiser, uh, one of the first wedding organisers. And she does UK. throw a very good party. And she does throw a <laughs> Well, she'd, she'd started off with parties. And she worked for the Admiral Crown. She did some incredible parties. Lots of stuff for uh, the Princess of Wales, uh, Robert Max, all sorts of you know, big, iconic 80s parties. And then she started her own business focusing on weddings. Um, and I think it was ITV were looking to commission a wedding series from her. Um, so she had a television agent, but actually that coincided with her becoming pregnant with Cecile. So she was on maternity leave, basically. Meanwhile, um, the BBC had cooked up this changing rooms, this crazy changing rooms concept. And her agent rather grudgingly rang and said, uh, isn't your husband an interior designer? Could he go and try out? So cross about it. I remember fuming, you know, I don't want to be on television. Why? And um, they made me sit in, a, you know, go to a studio and paint some shelves, uh, which I was <laughs> really unhappy about. <laughs> Spent the entire time really unhappy, deeply not wanting to be on television, which of course made me very attractive yeah. to them. Um, and uh, but that was oh god, Don, that was like 25 years ago. And how many series did you do? Of not many. They didn't do many at all. I think really? we barely, barely got to our hundredth program. It's not like now. Um, the, the, the producers then had a, very, had a very strong aesthetic, which is that it should never be more than eight programmes in a series. It should be a very big thing when Changing Rooms comes back. Um, uh, every year it should have a, a, a real sense of timetable to it. It should only be made in the summer where the weather is, is, is likely right. to be better. So we, we actually made very few. Was, in fact, it was like the early days of te Teletubbies when they only ever used to um, film uh, on a sunny day. We, we, we literally just did that. Later on, when I took over presenting it, we, d we then started stretching the seasons a bit more. But, um, you know, compared to everything else, DIY, everything since, it's extraordinary how few of them there are. The beautiful, treasured, little, gems. wonderfully crafted gems, yeah. So was it, I mean, did, did you, was it decommissioned or is it still sitting on a shelf somewhere? Might we see it come back? Well, there's that, that always, I mean, people always say, why, why on earth don't you bring it back? Because, I mean, it is, it's such an incredibly straightforward, understandable idea. And also, it is the, 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 the one that kicked everything else off. It is, it? it's the one that every, everybody else seems it's to be trying to copy changing rooms. So it, you do kind of think, well, it never. I mean, it, in many ways, it, it was also 
actually the first reality show um, because it was the first time that it was all about literally just filming what people were doing. It wasn't manipulated, you know, the, 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 the rubbish bits didn't get left out. I mean, if anything went wrong, obviously, that was the thing that got left in. It's when it went right that they didn't like it so much. Um, so it is extraordinary that, that something as clear and straightforward as neighbours swap, you've got a set amount of money, a set amount of time, that, that it didn't really, um, uh, didn't ever return. Um, but I, th I think, you know, I mean, one of the problems, with it, one of the reasons that it went was that it was just becoming swamped by programmes that were essentially about value. Uh, they were about how much your home was worth uh, based on what you did to it. Um, obviously, what we did on Changing Rooms did very little for the property value. Uh, did an enormous amount for the emotional value, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. It was the emotional investment for Changing Rooms, not the uh, financial investment. Um, but um, yeah, no, they were they were very very heady days. And how much time did you spend with the couples then? Did you have a, a, a good brief with them? Or yeah, I mean yeah I, yeah, I used to get to know them quite well. I mean the um, I, I mean I loved it. Uh, I, um, uh, I I really enjoyed it. I loved the practicality of it. I think, and particularly when it's you know when I finally gave in and said decided I was going to do it and decided I was going <laughs> to after having made the pilot. Um, I, I liked the fact that it was all about trying to do stuff then and there. Um, you know, I was building some really very big stuff for some really very wealthy clients uh, in, um, you know, some great locations. But actually, those little bits of film and changing rooms were, were great fun. We were, you know, at the top of a tower block and had 500 quid and, you know, some knicker elastic and very little else. It was, it was you know, I'm still it was live and acoustic. I'm still smiling at the idea of you being asked to paint some shelves because I've seen your artwork. Oh, God. <laughs> well, actually, in the end, I ended up painting some paper and then sticking it on the shelves to make like a kind of a, um, almost like Gaudi-esque uh, uh, tile mosaic, uh, which, again, I think they enjoyed because obviously it was so pointless. I mean, why bother? You know, why not just paint the shelves? Well, but I, I, got, I literally got that classic telephone call the next day uh, from the producers saying, well, God, that was, you know, your name is stupid. No one's ever going to remember your name. Your clothes are ridiculous. Why, uh, who would ever think of painting anything wearing uh, a velvet jacket and, and leather trousers? You're, you're haughty. You've got the wrong attitude. You just don't listen to people. You're perfect. Can you start on Monday? <laughs> And it would have been. It was that whole Monday. list of stuff, and I was thinking, I got away with it. I, and in fact, I mean, there was a thing in the press a couple of weeks ago about um, when I tried to get myself sacked on Changing Rooms, which is absolutely genuine. I got to the stage, I thought, I can't do this anymore. This is so boring. I hate the way that um, you know this is going. And it was a very aggressive season where, for the first time, it was a bit more manipulated. We did, we never actually were manipulating it that much. And I was doing a lot of other stuff. I was doing Homefront um, for BBC Two, and I was doing, I was doing Taste for Big Things, and I was doing, um, I think I was doing Fantasy Rooms as well. It was basically just too much going on. And I thought, I know what, I'm going to make my own Viking funeral on Changing Rooms by uh, basically not doing anything. Um, and we were in a, a large uh, kind of country house somewhere up north. Um, and I was working with a, a that's it, I was working with the... Um, head of the local council who was an SDP um, uh, councillor for the Tory councillor um, who was the guy that lived in the big house and the husband uh, of the SDP councillor who I was working with um, had a did quite a good line in, in erotic wall paintings so, went, <coughs> so basically you get on with the bedroom walls anything you want make it as rude as possible I'll make a bed um, in uh, using sort of nude caryatids, which I'll do in Tron Loy. And then all we'll do is sprinkle some rose petals around and light a few candles. That's got to get me sacked. And of, it course it, of course it didn't. Of course it gave didn't. You, it gave you another full For series. For goodness sake, of course it didn't. <laughs> I mean, it didn't help that actually the, uh, Laura McCree, who was the other designer, did something I think was perfectly pleasant. But anyway, my, my um, uh, SDP uh, uh, councillor absolutely hated it and did one of those real, was ripping it off the walls in front of the cameras. So, yeah. So that was that, basically. I was then talked down and told that I had to carry on. You're talking paint, you're painting walls. You're, you painted a wall in one of your rooms with cherubs and all sorts of things at home. And didn't you do it in a day or something? Yeah, I always do that to show off. 
you know, I mean, this amazing. is um, yeah. No, this is, but that's something that I, again I used to do on changing rooms. That was always the um, uh, if I thought the scheme was looking pants by the end of day one, I knew that the uh, the way I could rescue it was by painting something on the piano or above the fireplace because they come, they walk in and they go. Phew. That's got, that's got pound signs on it. So everything else looked absolute, absolute tat. But as long as there was an 18th century landscape above the, uh, above the fireplace. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I, I enjoy the challenge. I mean, in fact, it happened uh, big time. I'd, uh, uh, I'd been asked to kind of head up, but also design the Britain is Great campaign uh, house for Mexico Design Week in Mexico City. And this is all being filmed as well, because it was part of what I was doing in China. And I, I flew in, and literally there was, no, there was no roof. There was nothing. It was all concrete. It was just nothing. And the press were coming on the Tuesday. This was the Sunday. And um, I, I was having a... There was a BBC documentary going on ab about what I was doing. So I had a camera up my nose the whole time. It was just literally sort of, what the hell am I going to do? I've got bed linen, <laughs> but I've got no roof. And then I just thought, I know what, I'll paint a mural. <laughs> and so I did. I did sort of, you know, classical landscape, uh, uh, just in, in shades of grey and grisé. Um, and, of course, it looked absolutely astonishing with, with no roof and just lots of concrete and a big plush bed. It looked like I'd totally, you know, that's exactly what I... That was my concept from the outset. That's another one that I really got away with. They didn't, they didn't ask you to do with. that on Stonehenge, then? No, <laughs> no, no. Heady days. Oh, of course, well, poor old Stonehenge got very un, uh, uncelebrated the other day. Mm, mm. You mentioned um, DIY SOS a minute ago, mm. uh, and that's still running, isn't it? I think. Yeah, I don't know what's happening, though. I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, a progress, that's a series that, that I think is going to be very difficult to move forward with because of the particular conditions that a lot of the, the homeowners or the householders have got. Um, I think that it's going to be a very complicated project to be able to move forward. Um, well, I would think a lot of those people will be in the very vulnerable group. So. Uh, this is it. And, and so, you know, having not be coach there. loads of hairy builders yeah. turning up is probably not... Uh, but there are some amazing stories. I mm. mean, some of the, the spaces that you've created... I, I do quite a lot of stuff with disabled mm. um, children and their families. And, you know, for them to be able to come home, you know, it's not practical, mm. is it? in most cases no it's and I, I mean I the thing is that the um, uh, that's very much the, the the brief at the moment with um, uh, with the program is it it is about bringing people home um, I, I uh, I'm always very I have a very very specific flashpoint with all of this though which is that I, I feel very strongly that it also has to be a design show it, it, it isn't just you know a pity party we shouldn't just be all turning up there um, you know to pat everybody on the head and get them you know a nice big flat screen TV and I think a lot of that comes from you know, my mother was very disabled and and um, she was very very aggressive um, she was one of those really bitey disabled people um, because she hated the, even the faintest whiff of patronization um, and uh, um, I, I've sort of rather inherited that. I always feel that, you know, you, you don't just make something beige and give it a ramp because somebody's in a wheelchair. And I think particularly, uh, I think that's particularly prescient when you've, you've got a, a teenage client, um, although, I mean, it's, it's what goes right the way through, but I think particularly um, younger uh, disabled people have got a, you know, like everybody, they've got a real literacy for mm. design. Design is, a, design is an incredibly important currency um, for young people. Um, you know, we kind of take it for granted. You know, we, we, we sort of go, well, okay, we can, you know, we can shop around, we can do that, we can do this. But, I mean, it's something that I've really noticed uh, with my daughters as well. I mean, even with my grandson at three, you know, there's a real specific shopping list of things that they like and they want. And um, I've always felt very strongly, as, you know, when I do a DIYSS programme, that, you know, yes, I'm going to do the rampant stuff, but also... I want to ensure that we're doing something that feels, you know, very, very hip, very relevant, um, that, that is actually as much about the design as it is about the, um, the logistics, about the facilitation. Um, there was a big one we did a couple of years ago, uh, Young Carer Centre in Blackpool, um, and I wanted to make it so amazing 
that actually people who weren't young carers would be very jealous. And we, we you know, I worked with one of my art agents and we got stuff donated by every, you know, Damien Hurst, Tracy Emin, um, um, you know, a, anyone you can more say, Chapman Brothers, you know, anyone you could think of. This is one of the best contemporary art collections in the world now. Um, and it is just there as a, uh, you know, okay. theoretically as a young carer centre. I didn't realise your mum was disabled. What was her disability? She had uh, MS. She was very right. severely... Uh, she had MS for ages, actually, long time. Uh, I think she was diagnosed when she was probably in her 30s, late 30s, just after my brother was born. Um, but she was a very, very strong human being, a very focused... Why doesn't that surprise me? <laughs> She'd have to be, really, I suppose. Um, and she, um, she was extraordinary. She, she, she was incredibly severely physically disabled. Um, but fought so vigorously to uh, maintain an absolute sort of razor-sharp awareness right up until the very end. Um, and uh, uh, she was really scary. She was basically every single, you know, when you, every single period drama you can think of, there's that aunt that's not very <laughs> nice. Uh, that's my mother, Lady Catherine de Merg, you know. She's normally played by uh, Judy Dench, um, you know, in a very sort of spiteful, slightly spitty way. But she was a very, she was a very, very strong human being, very inspirational, and um, was uh, incredibly no-nonsense about stuff. Um, when, she, when she decided to, uh, and this is something that she th thought through a lot, she decided to uh, um, check herself into the, uh, the British Home for Incurables. Just what a dreadful name! Great, isn't it? Great, great branding. <laughs> Love the branding. Um, and that's so her as well, because it's quite confrontational. You know, even when they changed it to the Queen Mum's Home for Fluffy People or something, <laughs> she said, I live in the Home for Incurables. It was you know, all very Dickensian. But she, she managed to, you know, run the place, and she actually ended up knocking through, you know, so she had several rooms, which were all, uh, then I had to decorate in, um, you know, very kind of uh, uh, Knightsbridge light style. Um, but she, one of the things that I think she really instilled in me is that you have to be incredibly on top of the fact that um, nobody is the same and that actually people will judge you um, against their own standards. So actually, the thing to do is not judge them back. The thing to understand is that, you know, everything is absolutely how you do it. And this is one thing, when, when the whole celebrity thing got really crazy, and it went really crazy um, in the first couple of years. These days, of course, no one cares. It's great. I can shuffle through the Centre of Siren Sister in my pyjamas. You think you can. No one bats an eyelid. <laughs> Believe you me, right. they do. <laughs> But the um, you know in the early days when you had all the, you know I had loads of paparazzi stuff and everything and Jackie hated it. The children were really small. We lived in a really crap bungalow in Blackheath. You know we're very unprotected for that kind of thing. Um, but uh, it, it really it's one thing that really instilled in me is that um, you know I do an interview and, and someone would say oh you're so normal. It's like no I'm not. I'm my normal. You know yeah. you're your normal. You know the definition of normality is not something that you could apply to everybody. It's not a pasteurized term at all. It's a very, very personal term. And that definitely came from my mother. And I think in a funny sort of way, um, th her attitude uh, allowed me to cope with, uh, well, not really cope, I mean, that sounds so, so grandiose, but allowed me to um, kind of cite what was going on with those early celebrity days very, very efficiently. Um, and just go, well, okay, you know, people are making a fuss, big deal, you know, move on. Um, and of course it was Jackie who so cleverly then worked out that we, if they were going to make a fuss like that, then we ought to sell them bed linen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I love your wife. You know, or, you know, let's, you know, let's, because I had this terrible thing, which was that the, um, all my swanky clients literally just nosedived the minute changing room started. They couldn't bear it. Um, some were a bit snobby, it's true. But others just, they, they, they had a point, you know, they were discreet, wealthy people. They didn't like the fact that I'd be turning up for a site meeting uh, uh, surrounded by paparazzi. They, mm. you know, and the paparazzi were very keen to find out what was going on with that kind of stuff. Um, and so we were in this really weird position of uh, me being really quite famous, um, but ridiculously poor because there was no money coming in. Because um, obviously television doesn't pay any money at all. 
Um, and so Jackie just said, well, well let's talk to B&Q, let's talk to Graham and Brown, um, let's, let's start building a product range. And that was, that was 25 years ago. I mean, that was wow. long before that sort of thing has been done. And, and actually, um, we, we're now celebrating the Llewellyn Bone brand is officially 20 years old this year. And I'm very, very proud of you know, the, 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 what we've done to the British home. Mm. Well, and I'm glad... Made them unsellable. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, you just mentioned Blackpool. Cause you, you, did you choose the, the uh, place for carers in Blackpool? Because you know, you've got an affiliation to Blackpool. You do, you're very involved with the... No, they, 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 um, that was the production company. That was uh, the BBC. Um, and they were... They, I think they liked the idea because, yes, I'm creative curator of the, the Blackpool Illuminations. I'm also now, believe it or not, chair of the Blackpool Museum Trust, which... Um, I think it's highly amusing, bearing in mind the things I used to do to chairs. <laughs> it's, like, it's the revenge of the chair. Um, and I'm very, very fond of Blackpool, incredibly fond of Blackpool. And um, I, people are always a bit astonished. But I, I feel very strongly that somewhere that um, Britain allows itself to architecturally um, uh, take its bra off. Yeah. You know, everywhere else in the United Kingdom, it's all about the, the straightness, the rectitude of Georgian architecture or Victorian architecture or whatever. Um, actually, Blackpool's the only place where we built anything fun. Um, and when you look hard, you see that there's a, there's, there's a lot of quality there as well. Um, and I, I, I kind of love the, the engagement there. It's, it's, um, uh, it's a, a, a city that's entirely run by very bossy blonde women, um, which for me is heaven. I mean, that, <laughs> Erotically what are you saying? speaking, it's just <laughs> anyone, a bl bossy blonde lady is just perfect. But no, th it's funny because it's all about the, the, the sort of the personal engagement. It's, 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 you know, people that have got a real passion for it. But it, it really suffers from um, kind of being dismissed. Although it's funny because since, certainly since the last five years, it's been taken much more seriously, you know. Bodies like English Heritage are really looking at it. Um, and I, I'm hoping that the, 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 when we open the Blackpool Museum uh, next year, um, which has uh, the majority of the V&A archive and stuff like that, you know, it will put it into a much more um, historical context, into a much more cultural context. Um, actually, Blackpool used to be really quite swanky. You know, it's somewhere that you'd see, go to see Noel Coward or, you know, Sarah Bernhardt appeared there, disastrously, by all accounts. Yeah, she was rubbish. Well, it's no, always the, um, it's the kind of big milestone in the Strictly series, isn't it? Getting to the Blackpool. Yeah, period. absolutely. And the, uh, the Frank Matcham um, uh, Borum. And because I, I um, it was one of, after I left college, um, I got a job uh, in the marketing department of a rubber company. Um, and it always sounds so much more fun than it was. Because <laughs> it was rubber flooring and rubber crash doors. And um, I was dispatched on the train to go to Blackpool, which is somewhere I'd never been on a very wet Thursday afternoon in November to talk to the guys at the Blackpool Winter Garden about a, a rubber floor, um, which is still there. Um, and I can just remember getting off the street, and I think this is 1985, um, and just thinking, this is the weirdest, strangest, but really quite loveliest place. And also the other thing, we, we used to do an enormous amount of changing rooms out, uh, around Blackpool, um, because people that live around Blackpool seem to, you know, they, they really do enjoy their interiors. You know, and they enjoy strong colours and bold patterns, you know. Um, no, I, I never get any stick in Blackpool. You know, around here, everyone's going, oh, you painted anything purple yet? <laughs> Blackpool, it's all like, oh, I love your stuff. You know. Flock it up, Lawrence, you know. Flock, so what is, talk, talk to me about School of Flock. That's your, one of your Well, School of Flock, um, obviously, is uh, uh, my way of keeping my celebrity wick dipped um, <laughs> whilst we're all um, in lockdown. Um, I really liked... It was my son-in-law, Dan, who came up with the idea, and I think it's a very good one. Um, I've been uh, quarantined with two graduates of the Met Film School um, and a lot of equipment, so they've been very keen to do something. And, and I wanted to do a weekly 15-minute um, ramble around the, um, the kind of the backstories of cultural interior design. I think everyone's got incredibly literate and very clever at working out what their style is, what their favourite colour is, um, but there's very little to put it into a kind of a context. So, you know, one of the early programmes was about, you know, the stories that colour, that come with colour, the backstories that come with colour. Um, and that was really, really popular. Um, people, I felt, you know, then suddenly understood that it wasn't, it wasn't just a question of saying, oh, I like green. Actually, they could go back through 
a whole series of, of um, historical or sociological stories, even even uh, um, you know scientific uh, stories about the way that certain colours react. And so we've run right the way through the spectrum, really, including you know uh, I did a very uh, um, very widely watched programme on Aubrey Beardsley because there was a big Aubrey Beardsley um, exhibition planned at the Tate at the moment, which of course hasn't gone ahead. Classicism, Gothicism, uh, Art Deco, uh, wallpaper, you know, it was, it's, it's really just been a, um, uh, an ability for me to kind of riff on um, what, uh, uh, you know, what I keep up here. Um, in my mind palace. And it's really funny uh, working with my daughter, who's one of the scariest directors in the world. It absolutely takes no shit. And I'll say something, and she'll just look over the camera and say, really? Did that really happen? And so we have to stop, and I have to Google it. <laughs> yes, look, it did really happen. So, and you're filming all of this, then, during lockdown from home? Yeah, we are. And, I, I, and you know, it's now something that so many of the, um, the other, uh, you know, like the main broadcasters have got wind of, because we can send them at home, you know, filmed content from at home, which actually looks quite classy um, instead of the stuff. You know the way that you, you can't turn on the television at the moment without looking up Stacey Dooley's nose? Because <laughs> she's forever got the computer down here and it's just like that, you know. And now over to Dooley Towers. I must say, actually, I loved, you, you posted something on Instagram, I think it was this week, um, going around your beautiful garden. And yeah, that you've been doing. yeah. Well, we because we, we've been doing a series of um, uh, uh, films as well, which are a, a little bit more, you know, generalised, a little bit more um, uh, about what's going on. And um, I, I, you know, it's 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 been quite. They've been incredibly popular. I think um, uh, to begin with, we were a bit sort of concerned that if you were stuck in a flat somewhere with no out, outside mm -hmm. space. Um, seeing us one rolling around our um, uh, gracious Cotswold Manor House garden ginned off our faces might be a little bit off-putting. Um, but it seems not. It seems people, you know... A bit of escapism. Uh, people, I think people do. I think, mm. people, I think people look at what we're doing and think, yeah, well, you know, thank goodness I don't have that garden then, if that's what happens. Well, I think uh, there was certainly mention in the film, the little clip that I saw of, of Jackie throwing tomatoes at people. Yeah, no, she, absolutely. <laughs> she's, uh, um, well, she's, she's now... You know, you know how green-fingered she is, and uh, um, she's now colonising most of uh, the garden for vegetable production. I think she's slightly confusing lockdown with World War II. <laughs> um, and we, we, we've now got to the stage where we will be totally and utterly self-sufficient in lettuce for the next 20 years, um, provided we can find a way of keeping lettuce for that long. <laughs> Obviously, lettuce is not something that we'll freezes be round. well. <laughs> We'll pop round. <laughs> Lawrence, listen, thank you so much for your time. I really, really enjoyed chatting to you this afternoon, so thank you for Not that. at all. When do we start? <laughs> that was sort of quite a good warm-up. going to the wine bar. <laughs> um, so, listen, thank you to Lawrence, um, and thank you to all of you for watching. We'll be back next week with another guest, but until then, stay safe.